I'm pulling all the stops to make this the best series I can, because this is a game I feel very passionate about. I uploaded the previous episode early because it had no gameplay in it, that's why we're a little farther ahead than we usually would be. I know we all want to get to the gameplay, but I do feel what I have to say here is important enough to justify being stated, and being stated at this part of the playlist. I'm doing some short and long-term planning on how I want the series to go on, and I recently plan out my player party. If everything goes according to plan, all 15 party member slots will be filled by the end of the project. For the party members that will be coming alongside me in combat. I tried to go for a different weapon proficiency on each of them. It wasn't easy. If this is something you wish to do as well, I throw a warning to you right away. Picking your non-melee characters is difficult. Every entity in this game has some innate skill in bows, crossbows, and throwing. However, every entity also has a set AI that can be changed. You can give a girl a crossbow, but you can't make her shoot. If the party member's AI doesn't tell them to fire, they never will fire. This means that there are only specific party members you can use as ranged units. However, this can also be a good thing. Because of this, you can give your tank ranged items that buff their stats without having to worry about them trying to use those ranged items and staying a distance away instead of tanking. However, if you want your party to have a gun user, consider making it be yourself. There are very few party members that can even use firearms. Many entities just don't have the skill. Additionally, it is impossible to add that skill onto another party member through genetic engineering. That's not to say that having a gun-toting party member is impossible, though. Some citizens and certain specific units can wield guns naturally, and if you're playing on a Lona Plus, then you don't have to worry about this at all because it's very easy to find gunners. Just pick up a tank, put it. Throughout this series, I'm going to try to tell you all some information or lore before the episode really begins. While it may seem weird to put this information here, it's integral that you think about these things before you get too far into the game. You don't want to change your party's weapon types mid-game, because then all of the weapon proficiency you acquired goes to waste. Now then, let's get to the game. You're awake? Remarkable. I was beginning to worry that nursing a lowly adventure would bring our urgent travel to a halt. You were badly wounded, passing out on the bank of a river. It was fortunate that we found you before the dark mantle of night enveloped this whole valley, almost as if Ehekatl, the goddess of luck herself, had her eyes upon you. Stop your curious eyes. Yes, we are sons of the Viddale, whom they call the irreverent forest. Though we Elias, noble but blameless heretics, aren't keen to spend idle time responding to every senseless question about our race, you should be more thankful for your fate. If it weren't the Lady Guarnier who cured your mortal wounds, you wouldn't be hearing my tirade. For the Lady is no ordinary Elia, and only she can- You talk too much, Lemias, even though the one injured before you is still dazed. Yes, it's a bad habit of mine. Well, Looks like you aren't familiar with this land. Before we leave, I can spare you a moment to teach you a few lessons. We're gonna walk. You don't have to do this, but we're gonna play the tutorial. A wise choice. I will start from the beginning. You tell me at least you know how to move. Sure, pressing cursor keys will do, but it's better to use a keypad if you have one. By using a keypad, you can easily access keys which are used frequently, like 0 for picking up stuff, 5 for passing a turn, and Asterisk for targeting. Although there are many actions you can perform, basically you can access them using only three keys, Z, X, and C. Let's try them out. First, you will need food to live. If your stomach is empty, you will lose HP and your action speed slows down. Make sure you ha always have enough food in your inventory. Here, you can have this meat. Press X and press 9 a few times to select the E menu. Once there, select the meat on the ground. I'm going to take a bit of a recording break, so just give us a moment. And we are back. Now, if you're wondering, yes, I changed the resolution of the game to 800 by 600. The game does not go into widescreen, and because of that, and because this game is a roguelike, I will be using the extra screen space that I have from the game not going into widescreen to present some more information to the viewers to help with understanding this series. Because hey, this is a roguelike, and roguelikes are complicated. But if I learned how to play Dwarf Fortress, you can learn how to play this. So, one of the panes on the sides of the screen will simply be whatever task we are currently trying to accomplish in game right now, just in case you're skipping around the videos and you're just wondering what kinds of things I'm up to. Another pane on the sides of the screen will tell you extra information about whatever it is we are doing. This is really helpful for if there's something I want to say, but I forgot to say it or I just 
didn't for whatever reason. It can also include pictures and charts and whatever it takes to help get that information across. Lastly, there will be a pin on the side of the screen to tell you what kinds of things we've accomplished in the episode. I don't know how long each episode is going to be of this series, so I think I'm just going to can it at however long it takes for us to accomplish a few meaningful things. With that said, let's continue on with the tutorial. The first thing you're going to want to do is press G, the get button. However, um, if you're using the number pad, uh, if you're using the number pad, it is the zero button. And here's the thing: you can move with the, you can move with the arrow keys and all that, but um, you may want to use the number pad instead with number lock off. By doing this, you can make diagonal movements more precisely. If you want to make a diagonal movement with the arrow keys, you have to either press them at the same time, or press and hold one and then start holding the other one. And um, you know, just. It gives you less options, and it could end up being a way you die. I don't hope that's the case, but, you know, it, it's possible. Alright, so now that that's um, done, our boy Lamias here is teaching us the ways of life, how to move, and to eat. Because in order to live, you need to eat. Regardless of what race you're playing as, even if you're like playing as a chess piece or something, you do have a hunger system, and you can't actually see it, but if you are pretty full or pretty hungry, you'll see it as a status ailment on the bottomish left of the screen. Far left of the screen, kind of the bottom, not really, above the mini-map. Right now we are burdened, that is a status ailment that we have, although it's not as bad as it sounds, but we'll get more into that later. For now, though, we're not hungry in particular, but we're not full either. But we should eat just so that we can prove that we are able to. And Lamias has given us a corp of vigor. Y yeah. Um. Interesting. The inventory system is something that can trip up many players in this game, and I can understand why. If you press the X button, you can open up your inventory. And it may default to whatever it is you need to do. However, there are other tabs you can see on the top right. Examine, drop, read, drink, zap, use, open, mix, and throw. Each of these does have a hotkey that you can press in order to go to that one specifically. For example, if I wanted to throw something... I... Whoop, okay, if I wanted to throw something, I can press T. Capital T, rather. Or... Because normal T is just normal T is just use, capital T is throw. The controls in this game are actually case sensitive. That aside, if you want to go straight to the tab, you can just press the button. However, if you press the tab or the seven or nine buttons, seven or nine on the number pad rather, you can switch between tabs without having to go to that tab specifically. Anyways, we need to eat, so um, you know, I. I know that this is the corpse from a beggar. Um, I, I guess bottoms up. You start eating. Ooh. You start to eat a corpse of beggar. You have finished eating a corpse of beggar. Ugh, raw meek. Meat. Eek! It's human flesh. You become insane. You gain weight. Oof, you're pretty bloated. Yep. He just played a really terrible prank on us. And we've gained insanity. If you press C, you can open up your character page. It says that we have 7 sanity. It should actually say we have 7 insanity. Now, 7 isn't a lot, but becoming more and more insane can give you a lot of really bad status ailments. And gaining insanity alone will also give you status ailments. We just got unsteady, dim, and fear. These are pretty bad status ailments, and they're also going to hinder our movement. Like, I'm going to try moving up. And it doesn't quite work. You start to take your clothes off. Hey, don't worry. Um, our, our clothes do seem to be here. It's just that, uh... Yeah, that, that's one of the flavor texts that comes with being insane. Let's, let's just kind of, like, walk it off a bit. Uh, and if you ever want to rest, which just passes a few turns, you can hold Shift and press R. Capital R to rest. This will help you gain your HP, MP, and stamina back. Alternatively, you can just press 5 to skip a few turns. 5 is, you know, in the middle of the number pad, so it's like standing in place, and that's exactly what it does. 
Anyways, we, we shook off our fear, and Lumayas and Larnier seem to be talking about things, although it doesn't tell you who's saying who, but wh whatever, let's, let's just tell them that uh, we ate the thing. You need food to live. If your stomach is empty, you will lose HP and your action speed slows down. Make sure you always have enough food in your inventory. Here you can have this meat. Okay, I ate it. Uh, you, you really ate that thing? Oh, well. You can also use other items by pressing X. For example, if you want to read a book, press X, hit 9 a few times to select the read menu, and then choose a book you want to read. You can perform skills or other actions, including bashing and digging by pressing Z. Here's a tip, you can bash doors to break locks and trees to get some fruits. It can't be used to wake someone, but surely they won't be happy. Also, remember that space key is a very useful key. When there's an object under your foot, it automatically chooses a suitable action for you. I don't really use this because I've just trained myself to know which button to press in which scenario, but whatever. Let's try it now. Try digging some walls by pressing Z and using dig. Now, what you can do is go up to a wall, press Z, and dig will be on the bottom right-ish. So, just press bottom right or 3, which is what it would be on the number pad. Then you can dig. Then you gotta select the direction that you want to dig in. Now, mining is a skill in of itself. One that you have to learn if it's not something that you naturally come equipped with. But for some reason, this is what they wanted to teach us in the tutorial, even though it's not something that really ends up getting used in the game very often. No, don't worry, we will be using it, just once we're done with it, it'll pretty much get shafted. Whatever the case, let's try digging this wall ahead of us. And we dig through the wall, and we get a valuable gold bar! Cool! You have to identify this item to gain knowledge. Yeah, when you get new items, you won't always know exactly everything about them. Uh, so, if you pick up a new equipment, you won't know what stats are on that item. And items can also be blessed, or cursed, or doomed, and we won't know that until we get that identified. Well, whatever the case, let's tell him that we, you know, we tried digging. Looks like you found something. Yeah, no, seriously, I found a valuable gold bar. Many items need to be identified before you can know what exactly they are. You can identify items by reading some scrolls or asking a wizard in town. Remember that using unidentified potions or scrolls is very dangerous. When it comes to magical items, if you don't have identification on them, you won't even know what they are. It might just say, like, an old scroll or a green scroll. You're not going to know what it does. Same for potions. You can try using it, but you have no idea what it is, and it could be anything from heal to some monster, so who knows? I wouldn't risk it. I mean, really, if, if you saw a potion just hanging out and you didn't know what it did, would you drink it? Would you pop someone's pills without knowing what those pills are for? Probably not. Now, he says that you can read some scrolls to, ident ugh, read some scrolls to identify some items, and while this is true that there are scrolls that identify, not every character knows how to read by default, and that may be something that you need to know. Um, this is the literacy skill, and... Well, I believe I start out with it, but I, I don't remember anymore. Weapons and armor also need to be identified. If you carry them long enough, you'll get a hunch as to how good they are, but to gain full knowledge of the items, you need to identify them. This is true as well. With many items, especially once your ability to identify them grows as you play the game further, you'll be able to naturally gain some information about them. But with many items, you won't be able to know everything about them unless you truly identify them fully yourself using a wizard or a scroll or whatever it takes. Now I'll give you a scroll of identify, read it by using X and identify the gold bar you just found. Alright, so he gives us the scroll of identify. And hey, it's identified, so... A magical scroll with arcane writing. Let's see if we have the identify skill. If you press C, you can open up your character page again, and I will be press right, look at my skills, and good, I know how to read, I have level 3 literacy. Literacy is important because not only does it teach you how to read things, but there are some other books and spells and such that you'll need to read about, and if your literacy skill isn't high enough, they may actually be too complicated for you to understand. So this is an important skill. Thankfully, we can read. So let's read the scroll. Identify, and then it asks you what you want to identify using the scroll. This item is fully identified as a cursed, worthless, fake gold bar. Let's take a look at that. What a waste of time. You probably note, not only is this game's translation not the best, but sometimes it's outright buggy. I'm not sure if Noah actually knows English. Anyways, let's see. Alright, I'm done. 
Lamias grins, looks like he buried it unnoticed. What a dick. Okay, I will now tell you how to fight. Before the combat starts, you need to equip weapons. Take my old bow and arrows and equip them. Select weapons or armor, press C and press 9 to select wear. Notice that if you wear cursed equipment, they can't be removed normally and cause some unwelcome effects. That bow is cursed. Use the scroll of uncursed to uncurse it. Okay. So, he's also onto something here as well. He gave us the scroll of Vanish Curse. This not only will undo curses, it's very good at it. There is a normal uns uh, there's a normal uncursed scroll, but this one's better. So, we open up our character page, press 9 or tab to switch uh, to the equipment tab. And although I come equipped with a metal stone, eh, I'm gonna take it off and put on this bow. Book quip a longbow, great metal scary, you suddenly feel a chill and shudder. If the item's cursed. Now, because we haven't identified the item, it won't tell us that. Seeing that chill knows that, lets us know that it's cursed, even if the identification hasn't done so. Wearing cursed equipment sucks. You can't take it off, even if you want to. And, you'll occasionally teleport a short distance randomly when it's equipped, which is really obnoxious. This can also happen when you're trying to do something, so you might be just trying to read a book and suddenly bam, teleport, and that interrupts your action and can possibly put you in a fight. So, with all that said, let, let's vanish the curse on this item. Over to the read tab, and use it. We're surrounded by a holy aura. Aura uncurses some of your stuff. It'll tell you specifically what items it uncurses if those items are identified, but we don't have this bow identified. Okay, where'd you go? Here you are. Alright, all done. Good. Now listen carefully. Moving towards a target, you automatically attack it with your close range weapon. To use your long range weapon, you can either press Z and choose shoot, or simply press F for fire. You will shoot a nearby enemy. If you want to change your target, press asterisk. Get ready, I will summon some weak monsters. Kill them with your bow if possible. Try to stay away from the enemies, as those aren't effective in close range. I've dropped a few potions in case you get hurt. You know how to use them, right? Yes, use the X key. Alright, let's pick up those potions. Oh. Oh. Wow. Wow. Lamias is really a dick. Jeez. <sighs> like, okay, you know what? A potion that cures some wounds. Uh, here's a joke that goes on throughout the entirety of the game. Many cursed items do the opposite of what they're supposed to do, so... Yeah, you know, let's, let's not drink that. But instead, let's, uh, let's see this Pudit. This is a Pudit. It's basically the slime mook enemy of this game. They're almost as weak as they come. And, you know, they look like slimes. They are actually very important enemies, though, because we're going to be seeing more of them, and we may even want to have one join our party. That will be for a long time, though. For now, let's just fight it. Now, if you press asterisk, you can freely look around. You can't look too far away, though, because then things get dark, and in those darkened tiles, you don't actually know what's there. Of course, we can see all of our items, but if there's, like, a monster there or something, it won't show up. You can also target other things. In default, by pressing F, it'll target this Pudit, but if I wanted to target something else, I can select them, press Enter, and then press F to fire. One cool thing about this, though, it gives you a suggestion for how strong you are in comparison to that target, and whether or not you would win in a fight against them. The weird thing is, I find that this recommendation is actually true most of the time. I don't know what directly goes into it, but hey, uh, an accurate measurement is something I can get down with. It'll also tell you how far away you are from the thing you are targeting, and this is important to know for ranged combat, because there are damage and accuracy multipliers depending on how far away you are from your target and what kind of ranged item you have equipped. You can use a bow to attack things from long ranges, but if you use a bow to try to fire at something that's right ahead of you, you'll suffer some penalties, even though because they're close to you, you would think that makes them easier to hit, but whatever the case, let's fight this booty. Now, one more thing, and this won't be important unless you plan on going into magic at all. Um, if you target an enemy, or whatever, it'll also show you the direct path from you to that enemy. And this is really important for learning how to um, aim your magic spells, because there are some magic spells that will attack enemies in a line or in an area around you, and in that case, it's important to know what's nearby just in case you want to think about collateral damage. Okay, now let's fight the Pudin. I'm going to target it, you don't actually have to. Just F to fire at them. 
Now, when you attack an enemy, uh, you don't actually get numbers to tell you how much damage you do, but if you look in the log, you can see about how much damage you did in comparison to their total maximum health. Severely wounding him means just that. We dealt a pretty good hit to this enemy. Now, we could try to run away and uh, put some space between us and fire some more, but I'm just going to try using my melee weapon. Currently, we have equipped a uh, claymore and a small shield. The end of this game, I will be using scythe weapons, but this claymore is still important and we'll be passing it off later on. Whoops. Now though, if you ever want to attack something with your melee weapon, just walk into it. Slash the Pudent and critically wound him, and that tells us that we did an even better hit, and we evade the Pudent. Now, important to know, combat in this game only pa or well, everything in this game, really. Time only passes when you make your moves, meaning that you have all the time in the world that you need to plan out your strategy. Just make sure you plan it out correctly, or you could get destroyed. But, you know, this is just an ordinary Pudent. We don't have to worry about it. Let's just walk into it again. You slash the Pudent and severely wound him. Also, the Pudent punches you. It actually says that. Um, most enemies in the game do not have weapons equipped. In which case, um, because they don't have weapons equipped, it technically means they're like players using the martial arts weapon proficiency. I, I don't know if anyone cares. But, let's see, the Pudent punches you, you scream. We just took 5 points of damage, which is, like, almost 20% of our maximum HP, so, yeah. Even though it's just a Pudent, it did severely dent us as well. But whatever the case... Oh, now well, we missed. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. There we go. You slash the Pudent and transform him into several meat pieces of meat. And it says Pudent when it dies. Remember, this game is Japanese, and Japanese people love onomatopoeias for some reason. And there's another one. You know what, let's just, let's just keep trying to hit it with our melee weapon. Well, alright, that- oh. Oh, here, alright. Interesting thing that I need to mention. Uh, the Pudent runs away in terror. Yeah, so we brought him to the brink of death, and now he's fleeing for his life. If you have the gentle face trait, then- or feet, rather, then they won't do that. But, you know what? Let's snipe you. Damn. Bye. You may notice that the first time I shot the Pudent, uh, he didn't get another chance to move. That is because we outsped him. Time in this game passes based on your speed stat, of which we have 70. The more speed you have, the more turns you can take in relation to other things around you. However, unlike, say, one-way heroics, there's no indicator of this visually, so you won't know if you can make another move and they won't move. So, yeah, just know that more speed is a good thing generally. Whatever the case, well, nice. Well done. Let's learn a little history of North Tyrus. The sacred land governed by Palmia is known for ancient ruins Nephia. Occasionally, new ruins are found and lost by erratic movements of the Earth's crust. A lord lives at the lowest layer of these ruins, detecting great treasures and therefore attracts numerous adventurers. However, avoid those ruins which exceed your current level. You may gain a lot, but you may lose your life. You might find chests containing loot ruins. There's one nearby. Open it. And here we have a chest put on the ground. Now, we could press the G button to pick it up, but uh... Notice it's weight, 300 stones. I'm gonna pick up the log picks as well, those are important. Because we have picked something up with 300 stones, if we try moving, it's just not happening. It's just gonna say, you carry too much to move. Putting up your inventory at the bottom, you can see this little, like, glitched icon text thing here. This is basically your carry limit. We are holding 331.8 stones worth of items, but really, we shouldn't be holding anything more than 51.2. You can technically move with more stuff held than you're supposed to be able to carry, but if you carry way too much stuff in comparison to what you can, it just outright won't let you. While you may not be able to move, you can press 5 to wait out some turns, but if you do it too often, then the burden of whatever you're carrying may just break your back and kill you, so, you know, let's just drop this chest. Seriously, freaking 300 stones? If you want to drop items, just press D. Drop. Now, as far as chests and other such things, if you press the O button on top of them, you can open them. Let's open up this chest. And it didn't work. Many chests are locked. We have lock picks. The lock mechanism is beyond your skill. That's the indicator that 
you are probably not good enough to unlock this, but we're gonna keep trying it anyway. You use a lockpick, lock mechanism is beyond your skill, your lockpick breaks, try again. Yeah, if you don't do it right, you may break your lockpicks. We're just gonna keep doing it. And our lockpick is broken. Notice the chest has a lock. Locked chests require sufficient lockpick skill and lockpicks to open. You need to practice to open that chest. Be aware, those chests are heavy, and trust me, give up if you can't open them when you're in a dungeon. I saw a fool running around with a chest on his back, and he got killed. As you explore dungeons, your backpack may get heavier. Remember to leave stuff you don't need in your house. Overweight will slow your movement. And while this is true, it does train the weightlifting skill, which allows you to carry more. So, you do want to be carrying stuff to the point where it makes you a little uncomfortable, but not too uncomfortable. Because if you get too uncomfortable with it, you may actually lose speed, and that can uh, really end up killing you in combat. And if you're carrying way too much stuff, you'll actually start losing HP. Finally, I'm going to explain a bit about your house. As you already know, you can safely store items in your house, and the salary chest periodically gets filled with gold and items. Eventually, you might be able to buy a new house. You can do several things by using a house board in your house trial later. Alright, we're finished. You should already know how to survive in North Tyrus by now. You finished the tutorial. Yes, we have. But, there's something that I want to do. And we're going to be seeing one of the more infamous moments in this game. Let's go out the bottom and leave. Hi there! You might be the new- uh, You must be the new face my folks were talking about. Welcome to Irva, the era of Sierra Terre. I'm Norn, known as a guide. Helping you travelers is my job. So this is Norn. We won't be seeing her very often, but the times we do see her, she will tell you some very crucial information that you should know if it's your first time playthrough. If it is your first time playthrough, don't skip this! She's also probably the most trustworthy person in the game. I mean, we just got pranked multiple times by Lamias. She will not prank us. Here's my first tip for you. Having too much stuff in your inventory burdens you and slows your actions. Use your home as a safe storage since the items dropped in your home won't disappear. I heard some lazy guys are telling novices to read spellbooks in your home, because reading a difficult book sometimes results in nasty errors which put you in danger, like draining your MPs or confusing you for a while. Don't trust them. Sometimes failure of reading also leads devastating monsters to appear. You don't want them smashing and you don't want them smashing and breath firing on your valuable stuff in your house, don't you? The world map and passes a lot faster if free. You can't use certain items and skills in the world map. If you want to use them, you need to enter the local map mode by pressing the space bar or the enter button. If you want to know more about the world map, press question mark to read the in-game help. The help contains a variety of useful information throughout your journey. Remember to stay on road, as monsters are weaker than those in the wilderness, and occasionally you will encounter wandering merchants who will sell you quality but expensive wares? Remember, Japanese game here. Alright, so this is the world map, and you can move along it the same way you would when you're in a normal area. We're gonna move off our house and then go back in. It's your sweet home. Now, every time you enter a new map, we'll save. But the cool thing is, Lornier and Lamias are still hanging around here. Now, the game says this is our home. So, I mean, we basically own this place, even if it is just a crappy cave. If we talk to Lamias here, I'm glad you got well again. I thought you were a goner until just a few moments ago. You know what, let's talk to her a bit. How about North Tyrus? North Tyrus is a continent in the western hemisphere of Perva. Lots of merchants and travelers set foot on North Tyrus' soil with the dream of making a fortune in the ancient ruins of Nephia. If you haven't set your destination yet, you might want to visit Avernus. It's a mining town located south of here. Alright, what are you guys doing? We are messengers from Vindale. Our journey ends here in North Tyrus at the great city of Palmia where we're supposed to have a talk with King Zabi, a man of fairness and compassion. Uh, fairy tale? You may have heard the story before. It was once a prince who had his shape changed into that of an ugly beast by a witch. Despairing of his blood-curling appearance, he hid himself in a forest far from his kingdom. One day a woman rushed into his hut and passed out, having been badly wounded by a pack of wolves. He treated her with the knowledge and fear that his ugly body might scare her. This fear turned into reality soon enough, for she cried out as she woke up. However, as days passed by and she regained her health, the woman had come to recognize the kindness and generosity that was within the heart of this beast. She decided to live with him. 
They surmounted various difficulties throughout their lives, and the story comes to an end when the curse set upon the prince finally breaks, and the beast returned to his former shape, that of a flawlessly handsome prince. The two of them got along very well from that time on. A happy ending, although just an ordinary story, don't you agree? The elders of Vindale used to tell me this kind of story, but I never liked this one. Perhaps it is because I felt like the beast that she loved despite the fact that his ugliness had been left behind somewhere. Wow, Warnier seems to have some self-esteem issues. Now, okay, I may have said, um... There's a reason why I talked about how this is my house, and it does not have to do with her. I just wanted to talk to her at some point. If we talk to Lomias again, however... Uh... What? What? We can just say nothing. But we can also kick him out of our house. And you may want to do that. Because he's just been here pranking you this entire time, but no, you know what? We're gonna get even a different way. We're gonna get even in another episode. So, okay, I'm gonna cut the episode here. In this episode, we learned how to move, how to eat, how to fight, some of the things that may end up killing you, such as reading books that are too difficult, or trying to carry a chest on your back, or fighting someone you really should not be ready to, or getting punched by a slime, apparently. Things like that. And we got pranked. Over, and over, and over again. In the next episode, though, we're gonna start planning our revenge. I'm Brantcliffe. Goodbye, everyone.